first reading is from Isaiah, the 58th chapter, page 740 in the Pew Bible. Shout it aloud, do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen, only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for laying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here am I. Our second reading is from Acts, the 13th chapter, page 1105 in the Pew Bible. Now in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The word of God for the people of God. Today's gospel is from Matthew, the sixth chapter, beginning at the 16th verse. Jesus said, When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father, who is unseen, and your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, We're going to be together here in the Gospel of Matthew, the sixth chapter, unfolding what Jesus has to say about fasting. Let's pray. Lord Christ, we thank you for the beauty in this day. We thank you for your promise that your mercies are renewed and new every morning. We trust you for your mercies this day. Thank you for the text that's before us. May we use it for your glory and your honor. May we learn how to please you and others uh, through your tangible works of our flesh by the power of your spirit. May then the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Jeanette and I met while in college. We were worshiping together at Rolling Hills Covenant Church. Now, Rolling Hills, California is, if not the most affluent, one of the top three most affluent communities, not only in California, but in the nation. Right down off the hill from Rolling Hills Estates is a little city called Wilmington, California. Wilmington is in a place that's unincorporated, that includes the port towns there in the Harbor Gateway area. You know what I'm 
talking about. Some of you are from Southern California. It's a very depressed area and uh, economically poor. If not the poorest, one of the most poorest cities, not only in California, but also in the nation. So you have this tension, this dichotomy within just a mile or two of each other. Their cities actually border one next to the other between the very affluent and the very needy. We were, Jeanette and I, preparing to go out from Rolling Hills Estates down the hill to Wilmington, California and present the gospel of Jesus. We were young, we were excited, they were teaching us how we might do, it, do this, and so they gave us this little pamphlet called The Four Spiritual Laws, written by Campus Crusade uh, leader and founder uh, Bill Bright. Yeah, Bill Bright. It started with these words, you are a sinner. <laughs> and then it asked this question, are you saved? Well, we practiced and practiced. I, Jeanette said to me, Steve, are you a sinner? I said, yes, I am a sinner. <laughs> are you saved? And we worked through the whole process to the point that we basically had the four spiritual laws memorized. We had those down. So we didn't have to bring our little track with us. We kept it in our pocket just in case. So we met one Saturday morning up at Rolling Hills Estates. We filled our bellies with food and juice and coffee. Uh, we then stopped by Starbucks on the way into Wilmington. And we went to one of the more, uh, to, one of the, to Harbor Park, which is one of the more uh, poor areas of the area. And uh, we be began to evangelize to these in the park. How do you think it went? <laughs> yeah, that's how it went. How'd you know? I found a couple of guys who were obviously homeless, and I walked up to them and I said, how are you doing today, fellas? And they said, we're doing fine. I said, great. Uh, you do realize that you are both sinners, right? <laughs> and they looked at me like, well, who are you? Oh, I, I'm, I'm coming in the name of Jesus, and, and I, I want to ask you, are you saved? They said, heck no, we're not saved. They didn't use that word. <laughs> Why do you ask us if we're saved? We live in this park. We've both lost brothers and sisters and mothers to gang violence. We were kicked out of our homes at the age of 12 when we joined our respective gangs. Are we saved? What do you know about being saved? I said, great, have a, have a nice day. I'm leaving. You know, I, I look back at those times and I think to myself, wow, if I had that to do over, well, I'd do it differently. The Sermon on the Mount reminds us that Jesus, in his evangelism techniques, in teaching about discipleship, that means how to follow, he doesn't start with, you're a sinner. He doesn't start with, are you saved? In fact, I've searched the scriptures, and I've yet to find where Jesus said to anybody, are you saved? Now, if you know where that is, Come find me. I'd like to know where Jesus said that. You see, Jesus' main question was, are you living in the kingdom of God? That's what Jesus was all about. As I evangelize today, I have changed my tactic and my understanding of what it means to present Christ. So I, I never ask, are you saved? I never start where... I include the part about you being a sinner because that's not where God starts. God starts at a place of grace for us. If you think about it, the four spiritual laws starts in Genesis chapter 3. 
not Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 3 captures the fall of humanity. That's where we understand that we fell into temptation and sin. But how about Genesis chapters 1 and 2? Do you remember those? Both the same story, just told in a different way, of creation. And creation is God's grace, God's gift to humankind. We were created for God's perfect pleasure. The Beatitudes is where we start in the Sermon on the Mount. It's a reminder of Jesus to those disciples who have gathered around him that they are to look different than the disciples of other rabbis, including John the Baptist. The Beatitudes, starting in chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, as we remember, as we recap the Sermon on the Mount, are not just virtues to live by. They're an attitude of patience and hope while we're waiting for the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. We know that the kingdom of God has come in the person and work of Jesus, but it's only here in part And so we live in that tension between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of our world. And we wait patiently and with hope. And when we're doing that, it looks a lot like the Beatitudes. Then we learn, verses 13 through 16, about being the salt and light. This is Jesus' declaration regarding the kingdom of God and the people who live in it and their purpose. Their purpose is to be light of the world and salt of the earth. When I rolled down that day into Wilmington, I was all but light. (laughs) I was all but salt. But today I've learned, and predominantly through my understanding of the Sermon on the Mount, that we are to be salt and light to the earth and world around us. To make a difference. To fill people up. Not rip out what they already have. We know then in Matthew chapter 5, 17 through 48, that Jesus talks about fulfilling the law. He has these six antitheses. He says, you have heard it said, but now I say to you. And Jesus gives the true and ultimate meaning of the law and the prophets. Jesus continues to set forth the demands of the kingdom of God next to the Beatitudes and this understanding of the fulfillment of the law. He talks about murder and adultery and divorce and oaths and retribution and love. And then lastly, as we've been studying here in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus talks about three spiritual disciplines. Now, we took a lot of time on prayer, because Jesus did, as we worked through the Lord's Prayer. And so what happened there is we started with almsgiving. Jesus says, this is how you should give your alms. Then we went to prayer. This is how you should pray. Today, we wrap up that portion of those three disciplines as Jesus tells us, this then is how you should fast. So Jesus says, when you give to the needy, when you pray, when you fast, and he says these things to make a clear distinction between how his disciples act and behave and practice these disciplines compared to how the hypocrites, those were Israel's religious leaders, and the pagans, those were the Gentile religious people, practice and live their spiritual disciplines. Namely, Jesus says in this last part of Matthew chapter 6, we are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. Fasting. Almsgiving, we understand and we practice regularly. Every Sunday at least. Prayer, we understand and we practice it regularly. I want to say more than every Sunday, (laughs) at least. But fasting, fasting, that's one of those spiritual disciplines that many of us don't practice. Many of us don't even know about it. And by fasting, Jesus means withholding basic needs from ourselves 
but for a purpose, not just to withhold the need, but to withhold that need so that we might focus on God. Typically, this was done in the first century and even throughout and today through withholding from food. But that's not the only way we fast. There are many other ways to fast as well. Yesterday, I was kind of tinkering around at home, was reading a pleasure book. My phone was there, and I picked up my phone, and I just was making sure the world was right. You do that, don't you? Make sure the world is right. How do you do that? Well, you tap on Facebook and see what's going on. So I'm looking down Facebook, and the next thing I know, 35 minutes has passed. I've been on Facebook for 35 minutes. And I thought to myself, what am I doing? What a, what a total waste of time. I mean, I know what everybody's having for lunch, who's coming over next week. I mean, I know that kind of stuff. <laughs> you know. But it served no purpose. It was a total waste of time. I was convicted in that moment to withhold this basic need to know what's going on, to control, and to focus on God. I wonder what our church would look like if we fasted from social media. I think it would change us. I absolutely do. I know that it would change me. And this is what Jesus is talking about when he talks about fasting. And we would do it for what purpose? So that we might focus on God. What if I took those 35 minutes that are now wasted, I've thrown them away, they have no meaning, it's hay and stubble, will be bent, uh, burned up at the end of time, and guess what? I'll, I'll have to answer for those 35 minutes. Thankly, thankfully, through the lens of Christ. <laughs> right? What if I spent those 35 minutes fasting from what I thought was necessary, and focusing on God. I think my day would have turned out differently. I'm going to try that today. When I'm tempted to pick up my phone and check Facebook to see what you all did after church, I'm going to pray. I'm going to focus on the Lord. You see, what was happening in the time of Jesus is people were fasting. Typically, it would be a food fast. They would deprive themselves of especially those choice foods. And so in our text today in Matthew, what was happening is the Pharisees and the pagans had the wrong attitude. They would get themselves dirty that others would see them fasting. Their attitude was somber. They walked around like this. You know Eeyore, don't you? That, that's the, picture Eeyore. <laughs> Woe is me. I'm fasting. My life's a mess. Not only in their attitude, but also in their attire. In this 58th chapter of Isaiah, we are reminded that God does not see this kind of somber, getting dirty fasting or attitude and attire as a right and proper fast. In Isaiah, the prophet asks, is this the kind of fast I have chosen for lying in sackcloth and ashes? They would put sackcloth on, it's like a burlap sack, and they would walk around moping in their somber attitude and they would heap themselves with ashes. Oh, Woe is me. I'm hurting. I'm in pain. I'm so hungry. And these were the Pharisees and the pagans of which they had the choicest foods. So attitude and actions and attire, they would disfigure their faces to show others. I'm not even sure how to do that. What does that look like? Disfigure their faces. Their fasting would show that they wanted to be pleased themselves. Yet on the day of fasting, says the prophet Isaiah, you do as you please. This is what was happening. 
They were doing as they pleased. It pleased them to have the approval of the people around them. People would say, oh, look how pious brother Jacob is. Look how pious David is as he throws ashes upon his sackcloth-covered body, as his face distorts, as he walks around in this somber attitude. Oh, he must be close to God, they would say. But what was happening? You see, in their practice of fasting, they were hurting others. According to Isaiah, they would exploit workers while they were fasting. Their fasting would end in quarreling and strife. They would strike each other with wicked fists. Did you hear that as Peggy was reading it? When I was reading this text, it's, that stuck out to me. Wait a minute. Now we've just fasted, so we're closer to God, supposedly, and yet we're exploiting our workers. We're fighting and quarreling against each other to the point that it comes to fisticuffs. There's something wrong here. <laughs> We're not actually getting closer to God if this is the way we're fasting. And th this is what Jesus was fighting against. These Pharisees who would fast this way to find their own favor. But Jesus talks about true fasting here. He says, clean up, people of God. Wash your faces. Pour oil on your heads. This was a way of them showering, if you will. Their attitude was not to be a somber attitude. They were to walk throughout the day as if it was a normal day, filled with the presence of God, joy and celebrating, another day of life and breath. Their attitude was not to be somber. Their attire was supposed to be normal, maybe even prettied up with oil upon their heads, with washed faces, and their actions says Jesus, you do this so that it will not be obvious to others. You see the difference between the disciples, those followers of Jesus, the way they practice fasting, and the Pharisees and the pagans? You see the difference, right? The difference is that those who are following Jesus are pleasing God. Those who are following Christ have taken on the, the be attitudes in their heart and in their minds. They continue to be salt and light to the earth. And God sees their hearts. Their God who is in secret. Jesus says this. In your fasting, be obvious only to your Father who is unseen. You picked up on that? Be obvious, but only to your Father who is unseen. In so doing then, we fulfill the command of the kingdom of God. In our almsgiving, we give in a way that God sees. In our prayer, we pray in a way God sees and quiet. In our fasting, when we give up those things around us that keep us from focusing on God, food or social media, we do so in a way that only God sees. And this then leads to the fulfillment of Jesus' declaration, you are to be salt and light. It ends up in blessing the other, not cursing them. In Isaiah chapter 58, verses 6 through 9, the prophet writes these words. See, apparently... In the time of Isaiah, thousands of years before the time of Jesus, the people of God were still struggling with fasting. And so God asks through the prophet, is this the kind of fasting I've chosen? You see, now God is turning it around. Is, he says, is not then this the kind of fasting? And then he lists the, what fasting should look like. Did you pick up on that list? If you didn't, it's there in your blue slip. The kind of fasting God has chosen looks like this. To loose the chains of injustice and unite the cords of the yoke. 
to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. This is what fasting leads to. Not to those questioning, well, what do you know about being saved? Not to those getting angry saying, well, your privilege has nothing to do with the life I live. You don't understand me. Our fasting helps us to focus on God and meet the real needs of others. And then what happens? I'm going to close with this. These words of Isaiah, starting at verse 8. What happens when we take Jesus at his word and fast in a way that brings God glory? What happens is that we actually end up blessing the other. The prophet says, then your light will break like the dawn. Yes. Yes. This is kingdom living. Yes, Jesus, we say. Then our light will break like the dawn. And your healing will click quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you. And the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. Christian friends, may this, may this be what our fasting leads to. Amen. Amen.